addresses, make sure that it falls within those private network allocations that have been set up and available for us. This one I'm just going to skip right over because um, it's uh, it's detailed information, and frankly, you can go to uh, Wikipedia and um, get the same information in a lot more detail about uh, DHCP. Um, this is the automatic assignment of IP addressing uh, on a network, and it describes how it's accomplished. Uh, the only problem that you would ever run into there is if there are multiple DHCP servers on a network. And uh, as we mentioned before, all of these devices are intelligent. So if one of these devices plugs onto a network and says, give me a DHCP IP, um, I, I need a DHCP server to give me an IP address, if there are two DHCP servers on the network, that device is going to get a response from both. And uh, typically what it's going to end up with is going to be the IP address of the one that responded to it last. Um, but obviously this is going to be very difficult because as other devices are trying to find these unique devices, it, they try to find it by the IP address. And if it's getting one from two different directions, um, who knows which IP address it will actually have. And its ability to communicate to the other devices on the network will be um, impaired, won't be able to do it. Okay, so here's a basic uh, um, delineation of connections here. And this kind of illustrates a more real-world scenario because you've got, um, you know, the connection either coming in through a modem, which is becoming less and less common now, uh, where you're getting some kind of cloud connection, either a, a, a private WAN or uh, the Internet usually. And it's connected into the uh, WAN port of the router. And then from the LAN port of the router, you're coming into the first switch. Now, if you have a very good router that has a lot of capabilities like QoS and so on built into it, you may be able to use the additional ports on that router, but please notice that I've only taken one connection out of the router into the switch, and everything else is connected to the switch. Because I'm, I'm utilizing the power of the switch and the processing capability it has to identify packets as voice packets and give them priority over non-voice traffic. So this is really how you want this set up. I know it's real tempting to plug stuff into those additional three ports on the back of those routers, but uh, don't. Let the switch do its work, and you have to connect things to the switch in order for it to be able to do its work. So the PBX gets its spot on the switch. Um, Non-voice data gets its spot on the switch. A combination of voice and non-voice data gets its spot on the switch. So all of these devices then become interconnected parts of um, the, uh, the interconnected devices and, and what data is traversing this network. The key here is that this switch should be smart, and it should at least be smart so that it has the ability to program QoS. So when something comes in on this wire and it is non-voice data, this switch identifies that data as non-voice data, and it has a lower priority than voice traffic coming in or data packets that come in that are voice traffic. Um, and I guess one of the things I wanted to show you on that was the QoS, the, uh, the setup guide. All I did was I went to our wiki. If you go to the wiki main page and you type uh, QoS, you're going to get to a lot of uh, helpful things, and the first is the setup guide. Um, I took this on a day when I had access to our switches, um, and uh, I was able to get into the screens well. After the login screen um, on the Netgear switch, the FS728TP, uh, you're basically enabling QoS mode, and the trust mode is DSCP. What is important about this is that this is a Layer 3 protocol, and the switch knows to identify packets based on um, where it's looking for the information. It's either going to be Layer 2 or Layer 3. And Layer 2 protocols don't provide for many options. So Layer 3 protocol was introduced and uh, provides you many more options. And you can read all about that in, um, in the uh, Wikipedia, or uh, yeah, wikipedia.org. Um, quality of service, and uh, there will be a lot of different things that come up here, but you obviously want to select the one in computer networking. So th there's a lot of information that's available to you about quality of service, and you can learn a lot from it. But I would like to show you one quick one that we have available for you from...
from from the guide. If you were on our wiki, we've made it real easy for you to get information right here. Right below the table is a link um, that I really like from Netgear. Uh, Netgear has this posted on their website, and um, it's, uh, oh, I see, I had it open already. Um, this this gives you a very fast synopsis. Uh, I think it's seven, oh no, it's 16 pages. It's very short, nonetheless. And it's a very quick identification of what it is about um, quality of service that's going on and you know why it's important. And uh, certainly you can apply that to um, the telephony application on any network and recognize how important it becomes when you're trying to make voice traffic um, uninterrupted and uh, a high-quality connection. It's extremely important to deploy this properly. Now, what we've done is we have flagged our, um, um, our voice traffic as uh, CS3. And depending on your switch, uh, the FS728TP tend to be pretty easy to do, but some are going to be set in binary, some are going to be set in decimal made this nice handy table here so that you can convert from CS3 to the binary and decimal values. So it's very easy to deploy. It's really a very simple thing to do. And um, as you get through this guide, um, right here, uh, let's go to the wiki. Uh, let's go to the actual uh, um, settings in the uh, PBX. This is my uh, demo systems PBX. I'm in PBX setup, SIP setup, and underneath the advanced link, I'm going to go down to SIP type of service, RTP type of service. Um, well, on this one, I've got it set at class service 5. I'm going to set this back to what it's set at as default. These come up as default as class of service, or excuse me, um, class selector 3. And it's really important to make that distinction because that is that is what CS means when you're talking about the type of service in the differentiated services field or uh, specifications. These are called the um, the, cla uh, the class selectors, and by selecting CS3, we are saying okay, it is class selector three. After you log into your switch and you're enabling the DSCP mode. You go to where it says CS3, Class Selector 3, and notice it's got that binary level right there. All you're doing is you're setting it to the highest level possible. That's all that's necessary to deploy quality of service on the switch. But it has to be done, and it has to be done right. So you don't want any of the other classes or uh, class selectors to be set uh, at that level. You would want them all to be set at something lower than high, like CS3. Um, six here. I probably want to set that down to something like normal or something else. CS7 um, usually is going to continue to be high because it's usually um, um, allocated to network um, communications traffic, which is uh, very, very minimal, but obviously very important. Okay, so we've uh, touched on some quick stuff uh, about uh, quality of service, and uh, obviously this stuff is uh, extremely important. So uh, we want to make mention of it. Um, but with keeping it basic, as is the course title, we're going to uh, depart from here and just get back to uh, quick networking information that we hadn't covered yet. I want to uh, open this up for – I'm going to open it up and see if I can get a response out of you guys. Make sure you're all awake. On this next screen, I've got the, uh, the network deployed a little bit more uh, complex – and in this uh, particular scenario, I'm not using uplink ports, um, but I'm using the first data switch here as a segregation between voice, uh, actually a combination of voice and non-voice traffic, and non-voice traffic, if you can see how that's going on. Okay, so in this scenario, with these switches connected the way it is, uh, let's get a little feedback. Uh, can anybody tell me which of these switches I might be able to get away with not 
using uh, quality of service with. Or if there was one switch in this that I would be able to deploy and not worry about quality of service, which one would it be? Thank you. Three is the one. Yes, Les, you got it. And I need to get that clear. All right, and just so that everybody gets onto the picture here, what I'm able to do then, because switch number one and switch number two have the ability to uh, designate quality of service characteristics on packets, that means that anything that's coming in on this port right here from this non-smart switch, whoops, anything that's coming in on that port, data switch one is going to be able to tag it as non-voice traffic. So it still will become part of um, a topology of uh, priorities. And, uh, and fortunately, I'll be able to control it in association to others. OK, moving on. That was our actual question and answer period. So we were a little bit late, but uh, I think we'll be able to get through things, not a problem. Um, the next part of this is subnet mask, and I'm not going to spend a lot of time here. Um, I just want to give you a quick synopsis of what this is all about. Um, if you can see what we're what we're really doing here, let's let's call this an okay. It's an IP cloud, so this is the internet, and basically I'm traversing the internet to deploy three different subnets, and I've got three different routers deployed on that. Um, you can get all of this information on uh, the IP uh, network link that I've included on this page. Uh, here again, if anybody wants uh, my IP, I mean um, a copy of this presentation, uh, just uh, just let me know. Just give me an email. Um, I'll give you my email address. Where is notebook? There it is. Oops. All after epitome.com. It's my IP, uh, my uh, internet IP. Excuse me, my uh, whatever it is. It's my email address. Wow, I got a big one laid out here. So I would recommend that you uh, spend your own time on this because yours. Details that you can get on this, and we don't really need to spend any more time on it than um, this quick illustration that I wanted to bring up because it utilizes the IP address scheme that so many of us are, are familiar with, the 1.1. The and basically, the subnetting is meant to um, eliminate traffic from where it shouldn't be um, or where it's just not necessary. You know, if we back up a couple of slides. Um, if I look at this diagram, traffic over here is not necessary over here. And the switches um, will take care of that, mostly. But as this network becomes larger and uh, more uh, dense and data traffic becomes heavier uh, used, subnetting becomes uh, necessary. And I doubt that anybody will really get into subnetting too much. Um, but this is this is what's going on and what happens in a subnet. I'm able to break down networks into smaller segments so that they perform better uh, for their unique um, needs. Basically, what's going on here is I've got an IP address scheme of 192.168.1.1, and this is the this is the main router that comes in, and I'm splitting it into units of 62 um, nodes or hosts. So this router then further splits down that IP address scheme to be uh, 192.168.1.63, uh, uh, excuse me, .1 to 163. And then a second segment of 65 through 127, and a third segment of 129 through 191. And what that will do then is anyone that is on an IP uh, address scheme in this router or this subnet will traverse that ne network only for traffic that it exchanges. Um, this would be like departments and, and how that uh, comes to be. Uh, whatever, whatever the method of uh, deployment of the network is, 
Um, it usually will consolidate traffic to groups where it is uh, uh, most conducive um, to other uh, members of that subnet. When traffic is necessary to go between the two, then it goes outside. Um, because of the IP address scheme, this uh, subnet mask <clears throat> identifies these IP addresses as those that are local. Anything that is not within this um, um, uh, range is put out into the next le router level, where it then traverses that network to find out, okay, well, I'm still local to this main um, router, and I'm going to go out to one of these uh, other subnets. And if it's a public IP, then obviously then it goes out uh, the WAN IP address. So where this becomes uh, critical is in, um, in the use of um, your router and what happens to get through it when you're talking from a device that's coming in. And that's probably, well, you know what, I wanted to show you one other page before we get off of that too much further. I wanted to show you the page on <coughs> the local networks. Um, this is the local network that I have here on the IP address scheme of the PBX. So this is the PBX's IP local IP address. If I look on that same page where I was under um, PBX setup SIP, I have local networks and subnet masks. And this is all of the local networks that would be subnets to the uh, PBX server that I have. And where this comes into play is in that exact environment where there's multiple departments or the, the network has been deployed um, across several subnets and you've got telephones installed over those various subnets. These telephones must be able to communicate to the PBX, so the PBX has to be advised as to which of these networks are the local or it should, rec it should recognize as local IPs. And this is where you put that in. So if I'm doing the 172.29.20. Uh, whatever it is, as you can see, I've already got it on the list. I simply add it here, and um, and then I go on um, uh, to add it uh, above, and then it becomes part of the local uh, network. And now my PBX will recognize the device as something that's on a local network to uh, um, allow its communication. How I get back through that um, is is done with uh, NATing, which is uh, network address translation or port forwarding. And, and this is um, critical when you have remote phones or branch offices, uh, or even if you just want to um, contact the um, PBX server from, let's say, your office. If you want to get in touch with your uh, PBX from here, like I'm traversing the uh, uh, the internet by logging into uh, this PBX <coughs> via its public IP. I have to do that with port forwarding, and that port forwarding is handled right here in 8081. I'm going to the router, and if I look under the natting of the router under port forwarding, I can see that 8081 is forwarded. I've got both protocols forwarded to the PBX IP address and I'm going in on port 80. Um, port 80 is uh, the widely recognized uh, port for HTTP, HTTP protocol, and it is where web pages are, uh, are rendered. And the, the problem with leaving this 80 on the outside is that you will likely have multiple devices. Uh, I really can't do this because I'm probably going to have multiple devices where I, I want to be able to interface the web address and, or the web uh, GUI. And this is a perfect example. Right here, I want to access the web access GUI for the router. So I'm doing that on port 8080. And I want to access the PBX on uh, port 8081. So that's where I'm defining that. So um, here for HTTP access to uh, um, the PBX, I could even put HTTP uh, PBX. Now I know where that's going, and I could assign different ones, as you saw me assign before, uh, the various um, Netgear switches that I have, I can access via different port numbers. So these ports are directed to the internal um, 
IP address of the various switches on port 80. This is how you're traversing or you're telling um, the router when you when you come up to the router and you've pinged it via the public IP address, you're using this to say, okay, we're out or I want to have access to something. Then you're giving it in the <clears throat> in the back of that, you're giving it a IP or you're giving it a, a port number so that it knows what port uh, or what um, destination on the LAN you're attempting to reach. These things take a little while to boot, so I'm just going to let that go for a little bit. Um, okay, so um, from there, let me see. On branch office, 4569. SIP control is 5060. Um, interestingly, there is some, uh, this used to be a UDP protocol only, but uh, there are some new uh, deployments out that use both. So uh, we have been assigning this as both for uh, quite some time now, uh, TCP protocol as well as UDP protocol. Um, the epitome solution uh, continues to use uh, UDP only, but uh, you, may, uh, you may find other devices that uh, require TCP protocol set. Uh, what we're doing from that is it's a one-to-one. -one. Uh, we're we're sending it from port 60, uh, excuse me, 5060 to the IP address of the uh, uh, PBX on port 5060. The other thing that would have to be set for remote phones is uh, the port range, uh, and the port range has to be 10,000 through 20,000. <clears throat> And what we're doing with that is we're allowing this. This is uh, RTP traffic or your voice traffic. I either call it SIP RTP or SIP voice. And um, if this isn't open, obviously you won't be able to communicate through uh, the firewall to your um, um, to your remote phone. When you deploy a remote phone, and uh, frankly, whenever you're deploying any of the uh, any of the solutions, the best thing to do is to use a router that we know works well. Uh, I'd like us to, to expand our list a little bit and um, um, keep this growing. I need to do this outside of the viewer here. Um, but today, if you uh, if you go to support dot epitome dot com you'll be directed to this screen where you can go to support documents and then under the epitome selection you have a router compatibility guide um, and this is something where we like to be able to use DDWRT loaded onto a router there are many many routers that have the ability to load DDWRT um, but this is a list, and the routers that we have in use most here is this one right here by Lynx. It's, it's a WRT54GL. <clears throat> and the L is important because it has a, a, a Linux uh, capability, and it, it's predisposed to being flashed or loaded with um, the DDWRT uh, software. So you'll notice that this router, although it looks like a Linksys, doesn't say Linksys anywhere on this screen because no longer is this actually a Linksys router. It is loaded with DDWRT software. And if you navigate to the DDWRT site, let's see if this came back. It didn't. I'm going to go to uh, DDWRT with this open page. And um, I don't want to go to it. If I go to the router database, I can look for many different routers that are on here, and I uh, just start with Linksys, and um, then it's going to start bringing up names and uh, all of the various routers that you could load this software on. What's nice about this is that the DD DDWRT software is a high-performance uh, software that is open source and free, so you can download it and upgrade your router to the DDWRT load, and then you will um, gain from the benefits of its high performance. And the, the reason that this is important is because as 
the network packets are coming in from the WAN and need to be directed to the PBX, every single packet that arrives has to be designated and directed to the PBX. So you can see for voice it's extremely important that NATing or network address translation be possible at a very high um, level, very high degree of performance is required. So you're going to want to have a good router that has the ability to perform this task at a high efficiency rate. Uh, and DDWRT is uh, at this location here. Okay, the next issue that we need to discuss is uh, is security. And, you know, probably the first thing to define here is uh, the fact that the firewall is your first line of defense. And uh, we've been talking about the entire time. Uh, a firewall can be independent from a router, but it is usually part of the router. Um, a firewall is just that mechanism that says this is a... Uh, connection that is allowed on this uh, LAN or it is not. And uh, primarily what happens with a firewall is it, um, it keeps from the LAN any traffic on the WAN that shouldn't be on the LAN. And as we've just discussed, discussed the way that you penetrate that firewall is to use uh, uh, port forwarding or natting, being able to uh, traverse from outside inward. Um, the VPN uh, is deserving an honorable mention here. Uh, you need to spend your own time learning about VPNs. Uh, there's a few ways to deploy VPNs. Um, uh, a VPN is a virtual private network which allows you to have a connection uh, of basically a LAN IP address from a remote destination. The, the typical condition that you hear about a VPN is that it um, requires additional overhead. And, and that is true, although it probably doesn't require a whole lot of additional overhead. But uh, what's going on in a VPN is that it basically secures a um, local connection for a device located at a WAN location. That's what's going on with a VPN. Now, Wi-Fi is an interesting um, element in security. Um, because if you think about Wi-Fi, it is an immediate bridge onto a local network that um, you probably don't want there. Whenever you're deploying Wi-Fi on a business application, you should always um, have some sort of security involved. Um, WPA2 is the security that I use here. Uh, there are different protocols. You need to learn about those protocols, determine which one is going to be the one that you prefer to use. But one, I, one I'd like to just quickly show you is a very fast one on the router. If I look under wireless, and um, I do SSID, I have the ability to turn off the broadcast of this. And this is such a simple thing, but it's overlooked by so many. All you have to do is disable that. And this epitome demo will no longer be broadcast. Now, where, where this comes in, or the SSID is an identifier that, that says, hey, I'm a wireless connection, and I'm Wi-Fi, and I'm out here, and you can link to me. You would probably find one of these at McDonald's, and you'd get one of these at Starbucks and the airport. There's all kinds of them out there and available. And they are basically the very most insecure place that you could ever link onto a network. And um, it's not at all recommended. Um, you know, that's something that um, you do at your own own at, at your own risk. So that's uh, something you need to be aware of. But that when you see the list of the networks that's available when you go to the airport or McDonald's or a hotel, it's the SSID that you're seeing. And a very simple way to secure your network is to just disable the broadcasting of the SSID. A very simple thing, very simple to do. Beyond that um, is all very recommended. Uh, you should deploy some kind of uh, security level. There's multiple securities available. Uh, WPA2 is a, is a good uh, secure algorithm. And we like it because it allows you to utilize uh, uh, a shared key, and I, I use this in my uh, classes all the time. When people want to link onto the net, uh, onto the wireless uh, link and have access to my uh, PBX that I have um, and carry around with me on the road shows that we do, 
uh, they link to the SSID, which I do broadcast, and uh, then they put in this uh, shared link uh, mask code, which uh, they would not be able to access my network unless they had that shared link uh, code. Those are very fundamental things, and you need to be uh, familiar with them and aware. Beyond that, to the next level, so let's take it from the fact that we've got a, a firewall that's protecting us, we might have a VPN, we've got Wi-Fi that we've secured, now we've eliminated a lot of access to the network that people might have had. Epitome has implemented um, an access control list, which <clears throat> is by far the best um, method of securing uh, your, your voice application. When you're looking under uh, the system and access control, there, there, this has been in existence for a while. It's basically a secured uh, shell access to uh, the product, and it allows you to allow access to the system from various locations. Secure, um, uh, secure shell is accessed via port 22. So if I'm in the uh, natting of the router and I'm looking under... Uh, my port forwarding, SSH is port 22, forwarded to the PBX on port 22. The reason that port 22 is important is it allows uh, Epitome to be able to access the system at a command level um, uh, interface, and uh, we can perform much more diagnostics at that level than we could at the GUI. So uh, it's very important that you go to the router and open port 22 to the PBX. Beyond that, the access control list is a means to terminate any unwanted traffic in its tracks. So, you know, going back to the model where we've got the, the firewall in place. I'm going to go back a couple screens. See the firewall is in place. Right here, we got our firewall. Nothing on the WAN is getting to the LAN unless it gets to the firewall. If traffic is directed to the PBX server from the router, it goes to access control. And under the access control list, I have the ability to say, if this is reaching me on port 5060, and if you're all awake on this, that means that it's what? It's SIP traffic. If this is uh, voice communication, SIP traffic, coming to me on port 5060, I'm going to drop everything except these IP addresses. Okay, here's a basic 701 setup routine that is important for this um, list. And I'm going to muck up mine just because uh, I'm going to do it for your benefit. In my local IP, I have determined that I want to change my local IP from the default to something very strangely not default and something that I simply won't likely run into. So what I must do then is after I've set that as the local IP, right here it is, after I've set that as the local IP, I can now go back to this access control list and I can hit load recommend defaults, and that information is going to be included in the defaults. And notice that all of these other local area networks are also in there. But now what I've just removed is the external IP that I had that was my remote phone on my desk for that demo system. So if I kept this the way that I've just set it, my remote phone would stop working. So I'm going to navigate away from there and navigate back in so that I can get back to where it was. Uh-oh. Oh, it <laughs> didn't change back. Well, so I'm going to have to add one. Well, let's go ahead and add it. Now, if you if you have trouble with a remote phone and you're concerned that this is the stop gap for it, just hit this X button and it removes every rule about 5060. But you can see how um, you can see how very succinct this is in truncating any unwanted traffic. So let's take the uh, the IP of my PBX.
And I'm going to put that in. Oh, no, I want this IP. The public IP is what I want to steal here, and I want to put this into my demo system so that my demo system can communicate by SIP. So I'm going to add a new rule, and all of these rules, if you, all of these are the various rules. I've got a SIP rule, a call manager rule, a local manager rule, a TFTP rule. Uh, and if you remember TFTP, that's uh, uh, Trivial File Transfer Protocol Rules uh, or a server. Uh, the XMPP, which is chat now, I want to add to the SIP rule, I want to add that IP address. And I can, I can keep it just specific to itself, or I can use a CIDR notation and say, okay, I want these uh, 32 bits um, only. And uh, it, I don't know, it's a, almost kind of a magic thing there. Um, frankly, I don't see what the difference is between just doing this and doing this, but uh, many of the people here in uh, the technical support group uh, like to put the slash 32 regardless. Um, open notation allows you to include other, uh, a, a range of devices that's allowed. For instance, on this local IP that's a part of this rule, uh, indicating 0 through 255 indicates that it is able to have any of 254 devices uh, reach the XMPP server on the 172.29.20 network. That's what that's saying. So anyway, so with the 32, I'm basically saying every last piece of this IP address is significant when determining what the subnet mask is. Now this IP address is part of the SIP rule, and I will be able to utilize that um, phone located at that location uh, as a remote phone on the system. This is this is really key, and a lot of people get hung on this, so uh, take special note on the access control. One of the quick things that they like to do in technical support is just take you to this screen, scroll you to SIP, and hit the X, and that just gets rid of it all. Now, remembering that we loaded our local IPs, and then we pressed the load recommended default buttons, which gave me all of these local IP addresses. Take that for exactly what that means. If I don't have a local IP and a SIP rule, I can't even talk from one telephone on the local area network to the PBX, which is also on the local area network. The local area network IP address scheme must be included in the SIP rule. 